Okay, uh, all of that. Uh, instead, what happened is uh, we had a global financial crisis. We invaded Iraq. We've had 20-something <laughs> years of chaos, Here which we ties are. directly well into what was happening yesterday. There was a big economic conference um, of, with Wall Street bankers and Ukrainian representatives that happened uh, yesterday, in which the Citibank executives, BlackRock executives, big bankers, treasury officials, and uh, Ukrainian officials were all together talking about effectively what amounts to some sort of disaster capitalism uh, opportunity Correct. that exists for the big banks for when eventually the war ends and how they are going to come in and provide all this private capital, obviously out of the goodness of their hearts, not mm. because they're going to make a ton of money. Here is a Citibank executive. Most of these clips were flagged by uh, Michael Tracy, independent journalist. Let's go ahead and take a listen to the Citibank executive. We're hearing about all these reforms and preparing for the European Union integration, um, which is certainly going to address many of the issues we've been talking about for years um, that might have kept people from putting long-term capital into Ukraine. So I think that you said at the very beginning, Secretary, that we have to, you know, we have to, we, we have to win this war. We have to get this resolved. I think that there is there is desire to put private capital. Yeah. Why is there a desire to put private capital in there? Because look. They want to rebuild the country and charge the Ukrainians, AKA the US taxpayer, a tremendously high interest rate in order to rebuild it. Already they've come out, what does Zelensky say he's gonna need 700 billion? I think I, I think the last remember. figure is 700 billion. Why not a trillion? Just take a trillion. Uh, <laughs> Just while make you're it a nice it. round even uh, number. Uh, don't forget here the US Commerce Secretary, Biden's Commerce Secretary also came out and spoke um, at the same conference in uh, the same vein. Here's what she had to say. The stakes haven't been this high in a long time. We cannot let Russia prevail. And that means we have to be in this today, tomorrow, a year, two years, three years, because the repercussions to the world, to democracies everywhere, to freedom are unimaginable. Reconstruction and recovery, the price tag has grown to over $400 billion, and that will continue to grow. And here's the reality, and you know this, government can't do it alone. We will do our part. President Biden and our team are utterly committed, but we need you. This has to be a public-private partnership. One year, two years, three years. When somebody tells you what they want, you should believe them. That's what they want. They want to stay there. They want to stay there for a long time. They want to reap, apparently, some sort of uh, massive reward for doing so. All of this is being done in conjunction not only with the Ukrainians, the U.S. government, but the highest paid people in the United States, the Wall Street bankers. And uh, now the Ukrainians are even borrowing Build Back Better <laughs> as one of their <laughs> slogans. Not it, a joke. Because it works so well yeah, here. <laughs> apparently it works so well here. <laughs> Deputy Governor of the National Bank of Ukraine using that slogan. Take a listen. I suppose that, you know, this principle of uh, building back better so implies not only to the f f physical sense of the reconstruction process in Ukraine, but also uh, but also in the sense of building you in Ukraine as the modern, transparent, efficient, uh, competitive institution-based and uh, law, rule of law-based uh, democracy. Definitely, in order to achieve that, so we need a lot, uh, we have a lot to do in order to change, uh, you know, this... Uh, uh, acceptance of Ukraine as uh, as the country which is uh, you know uh, which is friendly for the private investments and uh, for the businesses. Yeah, I guess they want to. I mean, look, I I, I, do, I mean no disrespect. I feel bad for Ukraine for getting invaded, but we we're talking here about one of the most corrupt countries literally on planet Earth before this invasion. <laughs> I think probably the most corrupt country in all of Europe if you don't consider Russia part of Europe. Like you really think that after a massive war which has devastated the population that they're gonna come out and be a Western style like democracy? Are you crazy? Like you think that they're just gonna uh, overnight transform into some uh, dynamic rules-based market economy? What's more likely whenever countries come out of war which have a long-standing decades, centuries, frankly, long history of corruption, that they're going to become like an oligarchical state, like the Russians who invaded them, or that they're gonna become like us. How did that work in Iraq whenever we invaded that country? So you know what, we're gonna try and change all your traditions overnight and get rid of centuries of tribal warfare and all this stuff, and you're gonna become like New York City um, you know, in five years because we're gonna throw a trillion dollars at you. It's just, I don't even know where this stuff comes from. Yeah. It, it, 
how how am I the only guy who who looks at this and should be like, this is ridiculous? Well, you do know where yeah. it comes from because yeah. a lot a lot of money to be made yeah, here. Right. I mean, we focus a lot because it's the most obvious piece on the way the military industrial complex obviously benefits and profits anytime there's a war anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But it's important to understand there are other money making ventures going on uh, underneath the surface, and it's also important to understand there are other dynamics underneath the surface other than like protecting democracy and pushing back right. against Russian um, oligarchy and imperialism and all of those things, um, whatever you think of that aspect as well. You know, I found uh, a couple of articles about the push internationally from the IMF and other institutions to privatize uh, Ukraine and in particular their, their land and their agriculture and open it up to foreign investment, which was a push that was happening before this war started. And it's kind of telling. I found a couple of good articles, one written by a Marxist economist and another one that, let's go ahead and put this up on the screen. This is from American Conservatives, so obviously a uh, right-leaning publication here. The headline is Black Horse, Black Earth, and Black Rock. Part of what they lay out is um, there was a moratorium on foreign land sales. And Ukraine, as we've discussed before, is the breadbasket of the world, incredibly fertile soil. So there were a lot of uh, multinationals who wanted to be able to get into this market and be able to profit off of it. The IMF, um, they predicated, their, as they do, one of their loans on reforms that included lifting this land sale moratorium, something that was ultimately done under Zelensky in 2020. Um, additionally, during this war, there's been basically a repeal of of any and all worker protections, um, also in favor of this sort of like, you know, rugged individualist style capitalism that we and our global uh, affiliated institutions push on countries routinely. So effectively, you know, there's a lot of interest now in whenever the war is over, being able to come in and do what companies have been doing, wanting to do in Ukraine for a very long time and have been held off to some extent because they had this land moratorium uh, in place and because there was a huge, if you looked at the polling, the population was overwhelmingly opposed to this type of, you know, U.S. style privatization that we forced on country after country around the world. So, you know, that's the backdrop here. These are things that were unfolding and interests that capitalists had in Ukraine long prior to this war. And Zelensky has, you know, even before the, the war, been sort of a partner in trying to, to you know, to privatize the country and allow capital interests to come in and profit off of what is there. When you saw Zelensky at Davos, you know, this is like the backstory and the context with which he goes to Davos. Mm -hmm. And uh, BlackRock is very involved here. They signed a memo of understanding stating they would play an advisory role in Ukraine's post-war economic reconstruction. So they've got their hands in the pot as well. Listen, none of this negates however you feel about the Ukrainian conflict and what our role should be. But it's important to have our eyes open about who has an interest here, who has a profit motive here, and how they may be manipulating things behind the scenes. Yeah, I think it's very important that you laid out that way, Crystal, just about all of the ongoing stuff. And look, I mean, these were huge stories in America 20 years ago. Like, what, what would we talk about? Halliburton and uh, what was it? Brown and Root and all of the firms that were able to get like no bid contracts and the, the catering contract for bases in Afghanistan or all these CIGAR reports, the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, which you can go back and read about like one gas station that we spent like $200 million <laughs> on. I was like, what? why? Why? Why do people seem to think that what's happening in Ukraine is in any way unique in the history of the U.S. post-9-11 world and corruption? Like, there's actually no reason to believe that these institutions have somehow fundamentally changed. In reality, it's that people's willingness to ask questions about what's actually going on has actually changed, unfortunately. And uh, look, you know, just like happened in those conflicts, eventually people will wake up. Yeah, right. indeed. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.